How's it going, everybody? Uh, this is Aaron the Pedantic, and I have here with me Ash of Creativity. And Hello. We are going to be talking about his upcoming product, Chill Mist Valley, which I'm a very proud backer of. If I can get names displayed. Oh, we still have a Penix in terrorist for you. <laughs> oh, but of course. But of course, I'm never going to change that one. Never, never. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna have an ongoing discussion with this. Uh, this is probably gonna be about like forty five minutes or so. And people, you might catch the replay if, uh, and we'll we'll try and catch comments as we go along, uh, because people, if you have questions, I'm sure that uh, James here would be more than happy to give you an answer. So, what is Chill Mist Valley? Tell us. So Chill Mist Valley is an exploration focused module that we a scenario module, and we wanted to make that distinction between adventure module because 5e adventures tend to be, you know, they're linear, they're paths. Uh, you can't really deviate from them without the book having absolutely no resources for you whatsoever, which is the kind of style I like is, is deviation and getting around to certain places earlier than I should or later than I should. And uh, it's a style of play that a lot of people are more suited for, but that fifth edition doesn't exactly provide to you. It doesn't provide you the resources to run that kind of campaign, mm -hmm. at least to my understanding of it. The other issue was we had that discussion ages ago. I think it was the first time that the two of us were on together as we talked about the Ranger and the lack of an exploration system was probably the almost the center focus beyond the class itself in regards to... Uh, you know, the, the different problems that the ranger was fo was facing and why right. I didn't think it would be fixed. Yeah, I was kind of hoping that with the uh, the wilderness kit that they were, you know, releasing, that they were actually going to do something with that. I don't know if it did. I, I heard that there were some maybe mechanics on there, but I think that it was just more stuff from the original DMG that they put in there, which there wouldn't have been much that I could think of. I mean, maybe very little roll this to get lost, you know, kind of thing, maybe. Exactly. And that's something that if you have a ranger, you don't really have to worry about if you're in favored terrain. And, you know, if you're playing in one of my campaigns, honestly, if you pick like forest and uh, caves, then you're probably good. <laughs> you're probably good you that's know? how it is for a lot of <laughs> campaigns. And so it just kind of it falls by the wayside, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it, it is interesting that you say that about the adventure style because uh, there was a discussion uh, on No Fun Allowed's channel just just earlier uh, with several. It was a roundtable discussion, and all of them were kind of saying that they, you know, they had spent a lot of time running uh, official Five E modules and stuff like that, and basically that it's very you have to build like around it because it's just pretty much straight line for the most part. With with I think. Tomb of Annihilation may be a bit of a uh, an exception to the to the rule, but um, you know it's just it doesn't really have anything really supporting things in the periphery, and it's kind of it's kind of the feeling that I get from Five E as well, just in general. I mean, I think the exploration pillar takes like a whole page. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's primarily uh, don't starve. Yeah. Yeah, that's that. That's what it's about. It is is don't starve. Uh, make sure to track rations or you'll starve. Which, given that that has no real impact on gameplay overall, uh, people just kind of toss it to the wayside because it mm -hmm. doesn't have any any mechanical hooks to the rest of the game. There's no interlocking mechanics. There's no complexity to it. It's just, by the way, your character starves if they don't eat. It's like, all right, well, mm -hmm. we could just clear. We could we could devote an additional hour of game time to the thing that this game is meant to facilitate, which is combat, by just ignoring that. So that's what people do. Yeah, and I think that a lot of times the conversation kind of goes toward, well, if they're not supporting this part of the game, then it's kind of up to me as the, the DM to maybe just do something else. You know, like either... Uh, you know, come up with with a whole additional system to to find a way to, to make this interesting or to narrate something and then just have you know various challenges to overcome but the, even then it's still very railroady for the most part you know because it's like uh you know here's here's uh a thing that fell over and you have to cross it somehow how are you gonna do it you know and it's it's like that was gonna be the thing every time because you planned it, it you know there, there's really nothing there 
It sounds um, systematic. You're not randomly rolling on, for instance, a set of environmental hazards, mm -hmm. which is and, which is something we included. Yeah, and even then, a lot of times, what your solutions your solutions are going to be is pretty much like, well, it's you just do a skill roll. Everybody has the skills. You know, maybe you're a little bit better at the skills, but I mean that that tends to be about it. You know, as far as maybe you'll use a mundane item like a grappling hook and a a, a rope, but Chances are you might, you probably don't need that exactly. Um, it just, I don't know. I feel like it kind of deviates from what you could do, but I, I think, you know, from what you've, you've described, it sounds like you're taking a different direction, I guess, with how, how to make these kinds of things more interesting. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because one of our first play tests or our first play tests was basically uh, we ended up refining the exploration system since, but it was essentially you were going to choose exploration roles. Roles of R-O-L-E-S. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, for the purpose of, all right, I'm going to be the cook. I'm going to be the entertainer. I'm going to be the vanguard. Brad Milton says, if I kill a goblin, how many magic items drop? At least three. Um, <laughs> three per or goblin. you're a bad DM. You're a bad, or you're Cass. <laughs> We constructed this system so that you'll be traveling through a region. And because we're on a hex map, we have one hex equals one day. That's roughly 24 miles across. And you're going to choose these roles. And these roles all have different effects based on whether you succeed or fail. And some of them are more specific to whether or not the entire party succeeds or fails. Like the wizard gets to regain a if you're the uh if you're in charge of camping as the wizard. You could set up some arcane sigils and stuff like that around your camp. So if your rest gets interrupted, you guys regain a spell slot. It's pretty, pretty convenient. Mm -hmm. So you're like, maybe I need to, maybe I need to be in this. We need to rest. We're in a dangerous location uh, or we're in a dangerous region. Like for instance, the world below the underdark. And so I'm going to be the resting guy because we're really going to need our spell slots back. If we get caught off guard. Because it's just such a dangerous region. And the wizard gets that advantage. But the wizard has an ability for each and every one of these exploration roles. So basically, all, all classes have a new secondary set of abilities which tie directly into our exploration system. That was number one. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's specifically divided by class? Like it's not like an individual system that they're able to choose which role exactly? No, they, get to, they do get to choose which role. Okay. So the way it works is where 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 is it? Where is it? Come on. Same the exploration. There we have it. Excellent. So there's the number of how many how many do we have? There's uh, camper, cook, entertainer, fisher, hunter, survivalist, tracker, and vanguard. Mm-hmm. And each class, like the Barbarian, has their own set of abilities for whether they choose to do any of these particular roles. Oh, okay. Right? So if the Barbarian wants to be the Entertainer, uh, if the party's rest is interrupted, they can't be frightened until they resume their rest. Those resting can't benefit from this again until they finish a long rest. That's, uh, that's just an ability. But there's, it's there for all of them. So yeah, I'm just thinking about, you know, like a barbarian, you know, entertaining, you just, you know, uh, maybe, 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 maybe telling some badass stories or, you know, like, uh, I don't know, doing a jig. Who knows? Here's that time. Uh, there's that time Beowulf went swam across the, I don't know, the English channel. Oh yeah. 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 And he only lost because he had to kill about nine sea monsters along the way. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody's like, wow, we're sitting with a, we're sitting with the badass here. We don't have to worry about shit. So mm -hmm. now they go, now they're immune to frighten until they do X, Y, Z. So that's the first element. Then we track the successes and failures of the party mm -hmm. for the number of successes and failures that they get. Uh, for the number of successes that the party gets, that is a day that they don't have to do any across their journey. That is a day they don't have to do any encounter rolls because we have encounter rate tables for each region. Mm -hmm. So if you're in a party, if you're going on a seven day journey and you get six, six, six successes, 
uh, you will only have to roll on the encounter table on the last day. So you guys are concerned about succeeding. You're concerned about making sure that you do as well as you can. But at the same time, we're not going to roll every single day for encounter, 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 encounter. Because I can get needlessly tedious and tiresome in 5th edition. 5th edition is not built to handle that kind of, uh, that encounter density, frankly. Uh, especially across multiple days in which the consequences of engaging in these encounters are a little bit um, uh, time-consuming. It's, again, one of those things. One of our concerns is we want to include things that people are not going to throw out. Right? Yeah, we yeah. want to make sure that you have to use this encounter system, else the module doesn't work. Mm -hmm. doesn't work as it should do work because it's a lot of it is based on time limits and how much how much time it takes to get from place to place the world is progressing in the meantime the events are going on so if you guys screw up or or keep failing your encounter if you guys keep going to places where you can't seem to succeed for whatever reason you got to go around some way you got to you got to find a different way you got to or progress some other uh some other thread because clearly you're not going to make it here mm -hmm. And it doesn't it doesn't work if we don't use that encounter system. The next thing that we did was when we have the encounter system, and weather was particularly fun for this because we added a weather system. It's very simple. You roll at the beginning of uh, at the beginning of if you guys go out into the world, you roll at the be beginning of that, and by and large, you don't have to roll again unless you get on the encounters chart. And the encounter chart, rather than being a set of combat encounters, we have things like for forest. We have one and two are combat encounters, a CR 15 plus creature attacks, a CR 10 through 15 creature attacks. That's that's pretty much the only combat uh, uh, combat entries. Mm -hmm. Whereas everything else is the party becomes lost, the party runs into a patch of impassable natural terrain, uh, the weather becomes magical. Reroll on the encounter twi chart twice, reroll on the weather chart. The party discovers a shrine. The weather becomes more pleasant. The party comes across a ley line. They discover a reagent. An NPC benefactor arrives to assist the party. It's stuff like that. Where it's it's game game fodder, but it is not uh it's not all combat. Mm -hmm. There's a chance you get attacked along the way, and it can get nasty, but it's not the it's not the focus of Chillman's Valley. It's more exploration focus. So that's how we Adjust the things a bit. So let me ask you this: uh, they, you, you roll up the one with the the shrine and all that kind of. Actually, we have some comments. Me, I'll get. I'll come back to that. I'll come back to that. I almost, I almost screwed up. Uh, Brad says James Beowulf wasn't real. Take your meds. And if I, I take I, my meds, my girlfriend disappears. I refuse. <laughs> and uh, Condor says homebrew. If they are too tired or starving, they lose their saving throws until they fix that. Which brings in the problem of why are we why are we resolving whether or not they're starving? That is true. I mean, like, so there is uh, a question of do is that something that we want to include? Is that something we want to abstract? How you know does it add? Does it take away? You know, those are those are valid things. There's, I think, there's a reason that um, with five E, a lot of people are just like, I'm just not going to deal with it. And that's because there's it just the system just doesn't let, really cooperate with it that much. And, right. um, you know, whenever I'm trying to think of, even in the older editions, like how it handles starvation and stuff like that. And I want to say that it's just like, you can't, I, I actually, I'm, I'm actually blanking now. Like, I, I know that you track it. <laughs> I'm trying to remember how, like what exactly is supposed to be the outcome of, you know, if you are starving, if you are, uh dying of thirst how do you die of thirst that kind of stuff but i can't i can't think of it i just know that it says like you have to rest you know you have to rest every every so often and then you have to sleep every so often if you want to get your, your hp back so that is that is a thought um obviously i'm i'm cool with abstracting that kind of thing Right. Well, something we do is we have a natural acquisition system which interacts with the uh, – this is where we get to real complexity, which has been a discussion on your server over the past couple of days, whether or not something is just a series of gates which have no connection to one another but 
it is uh, they're time consuming and they're mechanics that you have to engage with to progress the game, but they don't really have any interlocking mechanics versus what I consider to be complexity, which is interlocking mechanics. Like for instance, we have fishing, hunting, and foraging systems. Mm -hmm. And the assumption is if you have a hunter, fisher, or a uh, survivalist who, who is in charge of doing the, uh, the foraging thing, uh, you are getting food. But at the same time, by virtue of rolling on these charts and players, I've recently discovered that players love fishing because they got one result that uh, we, we have our system is divided in between common, rare and magical entries. And they all have things like, you know, there's certain abilities you can get from these things. Uh, the fangs, sometimes you get fangs of creatures that deal extra poison damage or whatever. Some of them are worth more for the crafting system. Uh, they're considered more uh, they're considered more valuable for creating a magic item that's made of bone, for instance, or, mm -hmm. or for a specific weapon. And some of them just have unique encounter styles, like the, you know, a uh, a a silver fish that offers to give you information about the local area if you promise to let it go. But if you decide not to let it go, you have a fish made out of silver and it's very expensive. And you could go sell that somewhere. Or you could use that as a crafting component for something that's made out of silver, interlocking mechanics. So we reward you for going out and doing things like hunting, fishing, and foraging. Things that get you food. And thus, once we've done that, we can introduce an environmental hazard, an environmental challenge, which is in this area, for whatever reason, it is more difficult to do X, Y, Z. And you, so you must do it. It is required for you to do this in order to be considered eating. Or now you have to track rations. Right? Now you have to. Not, now it's important. It is the exception. Because by and large, you're not starving or dying of thirst. But in certain areas, it is more risky to do that. Uh, there are active barriers rather than just whether or not you tracked it on your character sheet. There are active barriers out in the world that are doing that. So now I can introduce it as an environmental challenge, and I can give you XP for beating it. Hmm. It sounds like a lot of stuff is uh, codified that usually we would just leave in the purview of um, just, just DM discretion. You know, like, uh, exactly. yeah, you can you can make something with those bones. Sure. But a lot of that stuff doesn't actually come up unless the player asks. And a lot of times the player doesn't ask either because they don't think of it or they just. Well, usually they don't think of it. <laughs> yeah, they, that's a, that's just it. They they normally don't improvise. No matter mm -hmm. like almost never they they don't improvise. But what they do will what they will do is if I put it in there either for the GM or for the players, they'll see that and be like, oh, this is an extra crafting component. And they're like, well this is a mechanical hook that i can hang an encounter on or an mm -hmm. npc on like if i codify curses which is something that we've been doing across the past uh across the past week or so roughly uh we had an absolutely we had an absolutely delightful uh curse which was one, from one of the fey lords uh, it causes you to your voice grows very loud after the first month and after the Second month, it starts dealing damage both to yourself and everybody around you. Right? This includes when you speak, when you use spell cast spells that use verbal components, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And it keeps progressing. It goes on one dice in damage every month that progresses. It ends after a year, but the particular Fey Lord that does this can refresh, can choose to refresh it, even if she didn't inflict the curse on you. So she could basically make this curse cyclical. There's a few ways to get around. We have like, all right, well, if you want to remove this with a spell, it has a DC. You can't do it automatically because that's stupid, right? <laughs> and if you, you fail, there's a cost to doing it. Some of your ability scores might temporarily go down or some of your other statistics. And we have methods of resolving that. We have a section in our encounter manual that says, listen, when we say temporary reduction, uh, temporary reduction to your ability scores, we mean it can be replenished in some way. And sometimes there is an additional note there that says it, a specific condition under which this will refresh. Mm -hmm. Like you took a shorter long rest, much like the shadow in the base fifth edition uh, monster stat block. But besides that, you might have to grab potions. You might have to grab, a, it might be a spell or a magic item that produces this effect. You know? 
So that's another interlocking mechanic. But once we did that, we said, okay, well, let's have a deaf NPC. This will be cool. We'll pretend she's an American, you know, we'll pretend that the Fae Lord who inflicted her with this is an American police officer, did some horrible thing to her because she didn't, because a deaf person didn't follow directions that she couldn't hear, and uh, inflicted this curse on her. But she's immune to her, the effects of her own curse for screaming. So she doesn't, she doesn't care. She doesn't give a shit. She's like, well, I used to live in this terribly dangerous area. Now I could go travel. This is fantastic. I have sign language. I'm fine. <laughs> and the fake lawyer, this idiot Faye doesn't doesn't know better because they didn't bother to ask in the first place. So she's just every year she's like, why is why hasn't she died yet? I have to keep refreshing this curse. <laughs> but it's such a delightful thing. It, it's like that's an NPC, that's a mechanical hook that the players can attach to. We have another one. We have another curse, which is uh, without going too far into it, it's just you you grow these claws. They're made of shadow. They have a chance of shredding any items that are on your hands, like gloves or gauntlets, including magical items. Uh, and they appear after about a month. And But they deal an extra 3d6 necrotic damage on a hit. But it's extremely difficult to wield weapons while you have these claws. Right. Uh, so you have disadvantage on all attacks that rely on them to be manipulated. Rely on your hands to actually be manipulated. Uh, but if a, for instance, a necromancer has a bunch of zombies and has some means of inflicting this curse. Now he has a bunch of zombies that deal extra damage. That's an encounter for us or for, for the GM, they could easily come up with something like that on their own. So there's all these interlocking mechanical hooks that can be, all right, well, I want to have a bad guy here. And there's all these other effects that are now codified like traps. We have a list of traps. We have a list of diseases. We have a list of curses and we have a list of environmental hazards. Right. That's in addition to the uh, 126 or 130 something, whatever it happens to be, monsters that we finished out with. And the effects of pretty much all of this, what did I just get tagged in? I get to ignore that. Delicious. The effects of pretty much all of this is people start paying attention to, and GMs get to start paying attention to challenges that they can inflict on the players that add a little bit of spice to things without being too overwhelming, right? Right. Here's a, here's a forest of twigs that absorb all moisture out of the air, and all the fire damage in here is increased by a little bit. So it's a little bit... So if you fight a fire elemental in there, it's going to be a little bit more deadly. Right? Little here's more an area that's dominated by darkness, and you have to burn away the darkness in order to actually see through it. It's, a, it's magical darkness. So unless you're that one warlock... And even if you have that one warlock, everybody else is screwed. Everybody else needs the torch. Mm -hmm. All right. So this was in reference to uh, your girlfriend disappearing. If uh, if you took the meds, uh, Brad says Aaron is real. He won't disappear. And I don't, uh, how do I know that that comment is real? <laughs> how do I know it won't fade if I take my meds? You take the blue pill. Uh -oh. <laughs> Uh, Condor says if uh, it has to be a real problem for players to see the value in dealing with it. Yeah. And you have to, you got to make it real for them. A lot of times they're not going to do it for themselves. Well, I'll say this a lot of times problems can be real and I still don't see value in dealing with it. What uh, can be real? Uh, a problem can be real oh. and I can still not see value in dealing with it. Yeah. In a, in more of a meta sense. Like if you tell me my character will die and you rigorously enforce ration tracking, I'll do it. But I'll be sitting there like huge fucking every time I go there, I'll be a huge fucking waste of time. Even if it's one second. Inconveniencing I, me slightly, even is a capital offense. Now I have to I have to uh, I have to denounce you here, you know, that uh that I have no issue with tracking rations. I don't find it a waste of time, but I do think that uh making it more interesting, you know, or finding other ways to handle those kind of survivalist ways is a good endeavor, I would say. Yeah. It's cool. Like when you when we play video games, we go out and we go out into the wilderness and we find a chest randomly, or we find little chemical reagents that we could pick up. Like if I'm playing Skyrim, I can go over and I can pick up and out. Oh, here's a butterfly. Here's a bee, and I can put this in a, uh, you know, I can put this in a potion, and it feels good. <laughs> I don't know if, I don't you know saw if that's that. accurate or not. I don't know if that's accurate or not. 
Condor, uh, Condor also said, I know so little about 5e in this area. It's hard to comment, though I'm sure many will get something from this. Yeah. Um, I mean, really, if I could boil down 5e in just a few words or just like a few sentences, it's like uh, take take like maybe some bones of like basic and then throw some customization onto the stuff that kind of seems like a little bit of 3e and a little bit of 4e, maybe some things from late 2e and stuff like that. And, um, you know, just make, make the world more high fantasy and kitchen sink. And that's kind of, it's kind of where harder to die a little, little bit harder to die. It's, it's still, you know, it's not as hard as, as some people say I've killed a fair bit of PCs on accident. Uh, but you know, there are a lot of like near misses that really don't seem like they actually happened. That is a funny thing is it? It's like if you're trying to kill them, it usually doesn't work. But just on oh, it's just like that random crit you like tends to do it. It's like, oh well, this guy has multi-attack. And now this person, <laughs> you're now down. This person is done for. Yeah. That was another thing that we had to engage with with the uh exploration system was so we started off with when we were doing the playtest campaign with the slow natural healing variant, which is when you complete a shorter long rest, you can spend hit dice to get your hit points back, Mm -hmm. but they don't refresh automatically. I like that. Right. It's, it's very fun. It makes hit dice quite meaningful. And we went with that at first and that was pretty good. Um, We wanted to adjust things. So there were two other rules that interlocked with that, that made us change and go a little bit in a little bit of a harsher direction. First, we included a set of things called secondary classes. This is one of the best solutions to having, you know, if you have a combat focused game like fifth edition and you want to introduce certain, certain mechanics that will not fit in a class, they're too anemic. They're too situational. They're not good enough overall for you to justify making a class out of like, you can't really have a crafter class, right? It doesn't work. It doesn't interact with the timers that fifth edition runs on. What Mm -hmm. you can do is you can invent a secondary class structure or even a tertiary class structure. You could keep going down the line and say, well, this is a separate progression that you will make across as you level. And it gives you these other non-combat focused abilities. Mm Mm-hmm. Right, so we have, uh, which I think we have 10 of them. We have Animal Tamer, Crash, so that's the other half of the Ranger for anybody who's who's missing that. Uh, animal Tamer, Craftsman, Herbalist, Lay Keeper, Minstrel, Prospector, Scholar, Trailblazer, and Trapper. We got 10. The Bards are crying foul. <laughs> that's the funny thing is a lot of these have interesting, like you can be a Barbarian and you can be an Animal Tamer. Nothing yeah. changes that. You could be, but you could also be a bard, and you could be a uh, you could be a minstrel, and or you could a be lot a bard of, who's not a minstrel because you, you could be a bard be who's a not a minstrel. You could be a bard who's a trapper. Yeah, you could just be a, a storyteller, you know, or something like that. Or, um, I've even used bards as diplomats, you know, in newer newer D and Basically, when it comes to like older D and I'm usually like, nah. I'm just not going to bother with bards, but whenever it comes to the right. newer stuff, I've just kind of had to accept it. Um, but yeah, yeah but, uh, I, more well-defined niche in those games. Mm-hmm. I think that I think that's an interesting way of of looking at that because I know you've talked about how you feel like uh, I know this is going to raise a lot of hackles here, but that basically video games are ahead as far as a lot of a lot of this kind of stuff goes and uh not you know just a little bit behind in the art in the tabletop scene as far as uh those things and yeah i mean whenever i would boot up like uh runes of magic or something like that it's like yeah you know i'm i'm a a warrior but i'm also a leather a leather worker you know or um or a miner you know that kind of thing and you know of course we had uh non-weapon proficiencies in second edition maybe I think it was, and I think there's a table at the end of first. But as far as like actually being part of the game, it was you know non-weapon provisions. It's in the second edition. It's like exactly. yeah, you could you could be a miner and you could like have that be a relevant thing. But as far as like support for it, you know, not really. So I think exactly, it's, I think it's interesting. So like you're actually building around it, around the concept. 
Absolutely. And what we did was there were a few different things. We made this so that we could interact with these other gameplay systems. Like the herbalist gets to roll every few days to see if they find an herb. And this herb has a number of different uses. And as they level up, uh, right about 10th, I think it is, maybe it's 12th. And this module is designed for higher levels. So the assumed starting level is eight. So a lot of people who are looking for more mechanical juice get a lot of it front loaded. And then, you know, given that we have secondary classes and given that we have exploration mechanics, there's a lot in there. Did you say um, eight? Eight. Eight. Like you start, start at eight. Yeah, you started low. Yeah, you start at level eight. Goddamn. Goddamn. <laughs> Demonetized. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the thing is like there's no mid to level, uh, to high level support for D&D. Yeah, fair. Yeah, I mean, so if there if if it's built into it and you know it takes those things into consideration, then honestly, that might be one of the first times I've ever really, you know, been interested in and that's well, okay. I, I can't say that definitively because I have run um higher level fifth edition campaigns, but you know, it's it's just it's just very different. It is very different. I completely get a lot of people's well, for one, I think it's admirable to make stuff for higher level things because there is an absence of it and it's like everybody just kind of wants to do one to six and then stop right um it's such a shame because that's the weakest part of the game for for me ah uh, on uh, the player side ah uh, <laughs> on the player side, <laughs> on the like player side okay there. on the player side perhaps you know on the gm I, side you can actually rely on your monsters in that range to hit reliably and to do damage reliably meaningful damage which is one thing that we took into account when we were designing the encounter manual. It's like, if we assume that we're starting at level eight, all of our level, our CR1 creatures can be meaningfully challenging to level eight PCs, mm -hmm. especially if you have a swarm of them, right? Level eight is a real level eight game. <laughs> <laughs> but you got a swarm of them because we know that it's not going to one shot a level one PC. And if somebody right. decides to start the game at level one and they use those encounters and one shots a level one PC, that's their fault. We don't have to, that's not mine. They, they went outside the bounds of the design. That's their fault. Mm -hmm. uh, but we were able to design the encounter manual such that everything could be challenging. Everything, like a lot of things have ability drain. A lot of things drain, um, have temporary penalties to your different statistics like armor class, uh, maximum hit points, Speed is really common. There, there's a lot of things which are just going to slow you to zero speed, and then they're probably going to... I mean, if you can't fight back, they're just going to take you hostage. That's what you get, monks. Exactly. Every time. If I see a monk, <laughs> you're getting that shit. I'm sick of you going so damn fast. <laughs> really? You're not Sonic. Real, well, ser seriously, that's the sort of challenges that you can introduce to these different uh, areas of the game. That mm -hmm. we didn't have previously because they're so worried about something being a monster being overpowered. Level so four. J JP is is on on team old school uh, as far as this goes. He says uh, level four spells are when things start going downhill fast. Level four well, spells are where your dungeon's meat grinder can no longer be relied upon to keep the players in an area of the game that is the only one that you think you can effectively run controversial take but i mean that's what we that's what we get from uh from james indeed <laughs> indeed i want you to be able to go out into the world and explore and have and engage in mechanics like domain play and warfare something that came of the play test was we have a in addition to our appendix for warfare we have an appendix for settlements now that was a lot of fun but briefly going back to the uh back to the hit points and stuff like that we decided to go instead you regain one hit dice per day one hit die per day. Uh, you regain, you don't regain any while you're traveling. So if you take, if there are environmental effects which cause damage while you're traveling, um, that's going to, that's going to cause a problem. We are probably going to introduce a, a consequence for uh, recovering spell slots. Like you might have to roll it. You might have to roll a hit die and the, the result on that hit die determines what, what kind of, um, spell slot you can get back you know of that level or lower and the final thing we did is all of these secondary classes that we've introduced now ha all have their own dice pools and they're all equal of equal size to and share the pool of your hit dice hmm. so, so you can have what's up 
So, so they grow with you. Yeah, they grow with you. So if you're level 12 barbarian, you have, uh, in addition to your 12 hit dice, you have 12 uh, D12 die of whatever your sec of whatever your class die are. So if you're an herbalist, when you roll your herbalist die, you roll D12. And that's that's great because that means being a barbarian, even if you're a barbarian, so you don't normally have access to magical power or you don't normally have access to uh, certain other abilities. If you're like an animal tamer, you can increase or decrease the attack of an of a beast or similar animalistic creature by that D12, which is better than, for instance, a uh, a wizard with an mm. animal companion. That's one advantage that they get. So now choosing barbarian has this additional uh, this additional dimension on with on which you're getting certain advantages and disadvantages. Mm -hmm. Of course, the wizard might be able to do certain combinations with spells, both in and outside of combat, with this animal companion that makes them more uh, valuable in that regard, like mm -hmm. casting dragon's breath on them. Which is another element of the encounter manual that we went into. All the encounter manual entries for monsters have a few have a few different. Um, descriptions like uh component mechanics here's some useful components if they have any mechanical uses for them here's what they are other than that here's a table a harvesting check dc and a description of uh what the thing is considered more valuable for when you're crafting so if you if you kill you know if you kill a moth you can take the some one of our moths in there anyways um it's a magical beast if you take the dust off of it it's more valuable for crafting poisons or for potions that have to do with the moon or lunar stuff additionally with any uh any magical spells that might have anything to do with the moon so that's a useful component section that's additional information there's knowledge dcs in there and there's harvesting dcs in there then we have the social component which is you could either tame bind or uh, uh, engage in parlay with a lot of these creatures. And some of them allow you to do more than one. But the idea being, what's it like to bind an elemental? Is there a process for this, a ritualistic process for this that doesn't involve being a certain level spellcaster? It just involves whether or not you have the skill and resources to entrap this creature and force it into, for instance, uh, a suit of copper, which is useful for controlling elementals or in the case of aberrations a uh a binds of made of zinc which is a vance reference uh and different ways that you can control this creature but usually you can't get the full power of this creature and usually there are conditions under which like for instance one of the draconic style elementals that we have mechanics for taming uh if you damage the the suit that you have to put them in once they reach half uh they're free of that of the binding so when you if you bring this thing into combat, you're looking at it like, all right, it actually has half the hit points it says on the stat block. After that half, now it's probably a hostile creature again. Hmm. Now it's an enemy instead of one of my allies, unless I have a suit with uh, another suit with me and can get, slip it on it, and assuming assuming it takes. And the final one is uh, is taming. Or sorry, not the final one. The next one is taming, mostly for natural beasts or animal animalistic creatures. Uh, mechanics by which you can say like there's things for a dire parastoid wasp right which is a terrifying thing terrifying stat block injects its eggs into you and they sh and they burst out shortly thereafter oh, and there's geez. a fun little note in there it's like well if you let it sting you and let it inject you but clear the eggs out it will defend you because it thinks that the eggs are still in there deeply <laughs> grotesque but now you have this horrifying monster at your disposal Nice. And just, you know, you're just risking death in order to do it. It's like, well, why haven't my babies come out yet? What the hell? <laughs> well, it doesn't care about that. It just smells the pheromone on you and it keeps going. Uh, uh, so Pete is probably uh, somebody that you, you might see eye to eye with on this. Uh, he says, uh, I find some of 5e classes remove what players may find fun about playing the class by creating a hand wave for key concepts. For example, the ranger. Inclined to agree. Inclined to agree. It sucks. One of the things we did was there's so many different versions of the Ranger at this point, including ones that we've developed. If we had more time or if we were just developing a different system, 
uh, this is, hey, this is one tie into something you asked me about earlier about Lords of Brackus. The D20 version of Lords of Brackus is going to be renamed Lords of Samaid and basically tied in with Chilmas Valley. Nice. Uh, but one thing that we had an idea for was given that we, there's all these rangers out there, what if we make it so that these other external systems interact with the, the base ranger and pretty much any ranger you can think of, but especially the base ranger and make it more useful by virtue of engaging with these other mechanics. So for instance, in the base ranger, I think it says that whenever you forage for, whenever you engage in foraging, your bounty is doubled. But we have a forging mechanic with some extraordinarily valuable items that you have the potential the potential to get. Mm -hmm. Now you get two of them if you're playing a ranger. The base PHB ranger, if you're playing that thing, now you get two of them. Fantastic. Now I just got a thousand gold instead of five hundred gold. Nice. Right. And and now they get to now they get to be happy with that. Uh, ditto for the exploration mechanics. It's a natural terrain and natural explore. They're all, uh, you know, they're all important. Uh, or both they're not important in the base game. But for the exploration mechanics that we have, well, now you have advantage on it. Now you have advantage on this check that you're normally not allowed to have advantage on unless you have some sort of effect that is longer than the duration. That's a stipulation we put in there. So your guy who likes to spam guidance is no longer allowed to do so. Mm. Yeah. Sorry, That's you cold. Get that, that D four. Now it hit home. It hit home because I'm usually the cleric. <laughs> <laughs> but you can do it if you have if you have effects that give you advantage on these things for longer durations of time than the time you're engaged with them. Mm -hmm. Like for instance, if you have a constant effect from your class feature that gives you advantage, now you're more likely to succeed on these exploration roles based on whether or not you're traveling through your favorite terrain. And that means, of course, maybe you're more inclined to travel through your favorite terrain than the other one. That's going to change your route. That's going to change the encounters you run across because each of the terrains have have their own individual, um, each of their own individual specifications, and their own encounter charts, and their own fishing and foraging and hunting charts. It's a it's a tremendous amount. God, it's it's like thirty something pages of these things. There's so much variety to them, mm -hmm. and it makes a choice. Uh, even if it doesn't mean much to you, it has an impact on the game. Like, even if it's not, if that's not your bread and butter, you still get to enjoy it. Just have to increase all DCs by two at a certain point. Yeah. Yeah. It's so fucking annoying. It's so, I don't know why it sticks in my crawl like that. Normally it doesn't like normally it's like, Oh, that person's spamming firebolt. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, whatever doesn't bother me that much. I, I change it when I'm designing my own game, but in the fifth edition, this bother me. Seeing guidance go off, I'm like, oh. I have no idea why I look at that. I'm like, you shouldn't be able to do that. I I I, I understand. Like, I have I have my own particulars that I just, I'm like, I don't know why I hate it, but I just do. Uh, so, you know, I guess one last thing before I have to wrap it up, but um, you mentioned, you know, making more gold. Uh, what kind of stuff do they spend gold on? So the biggest thing that you're going to spend gold on is probably units. And by extension of units, uh, towns, cities, and settlements. Uh, I think our base cost, let me pull up the document here. Uh, all the base costs for our units and stuff like that are in the, are, are in the hundreds. You know, for things like heroes and monsters, which we also have included. It's very, it's sort of chainmail esque, uh, except we have unit dice. Like you roll 2d8, you roll 2d12, and that's your, that functions as both your attack and damage. And it's a fun little, even though it's not how fifth edition works, we're like, well, it's an appendix. We don't care. And it just makes it easier to, to do this thing. And so people who are entranced by mass combat, they're going to be fine. But cost per, you know, we have cost per XP, which is like, Cavalry, 250. If you buy a level zero cav unit, it's 250 gold pieces. And the upkeep per season of that is 20%. So that's 50 gold pieces per season. Hmm. So it's expensive. It's expensive. But that is a means of if you're given that combat is more deadly in Chilmas Valley, if you decide 
that you want to get your XP, get your loot, and progress the progress the world state via mass, not using regular combat, individual combat. You want to do it via mass combat. You have the opportunity to. You just need to get enough gold for it, and then you're good. Which is where our other system comes in. Is the uh, let me check here. Yeah, there it is. There it is. CMV settlements. Where you set up a settlement. We have major settlements, which are basically cities, right? And we have a we have a tracking mechanism for that for level one, level two, level three. There's buildings that you can buy and purchase and construct. Uh, and they're limited by the level of your city. So that's another interlocking mechanic. You have to get your city to level three before you could have a level three, um, a level three barracks or a level three enchanter, or a level three uh blacksmith mm -hmm. or smithy or or ranger lodge or stables whatever have you and these all have an interlocking mechanic with all right well now you could spend gold on these things and you get a very practical benefit for them like if you have an enchanter which is level three or whatever uh now is it once per what is it every 1d4 minus one seasons as a special a lot of these shops have special benefits to them Every 1d4 minus one seasons, the enchanter produces a ma random magical item. And the magic item is according to its item, the item rarity that's available with the enchanter. So at level three, that's rare. Your 1d4 minus one seasons produces a rare magical item for you. And you can either sell that off or whatever. But it gives me information on, for instance, this settlement is level three. And we'll say it has a level, a level three smithy. And I then know, as the GM that no you can't repair your plate armor here because mm -hmm. it only covers because at that point the item cost that you four items that are available in the smithy only goes up to a thousand gold pieces so you can't buy plate armor here and you're not going to be able to repair it here probably and that's an interesting mechanical hook i i talked about that a few months ago actually when it came to um there is no mario kart in chillness valley i'm sorry brad <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately not not yet maybe maybe the supplement brad you're is in that a, uh, is that a temple of uh not dungeon of the mad what's that stupid temple of doom what are you what was it what's the meat grinder one that they brought back tomb of horrors oh yeah yeah your tomb of annihilation i think they had dino racing in there or something like that oh yeah they had uh it, they did they did it was uh it was like velociraptors or something i don't know it's some kind of some kind of yeah it was dinosaur racing yeah dino uh racing. well you know so i know we, we the kickstarter is already done as done a while back um but like if people are interested in you know once it's done how do they how do they get in on it on drive through RPG or Brad, God damn it! <laughs> on drive through RPG, we're actually going to be releasing the encounter manual separately, um, and that's I think that's our point nine version of that is going out either tomorrow or the day after. Oh wow! Yeah, it's a lot of pages. That's going to burn such a fucking hole in my wallet. <laughs> it's going to burn such a hole in my wallet. We're we're up to like one hundred sixty pages Jeez. for just the encounter manual. And it's and they're mostly unique monsters. A few, there's a few monsters in there like Manticores. We're like, well, what's the semi, what's the Chilmus Valley version of these guys mm -hmm. and, and stuff like that? But they're mostly unique. And um, a few of them are throwbacks to earlier editions. If you played earlier editions, you'll recognize like, hey, that seems familiar. Slightly different mechanics, but yeah, you you find on Drive Through RPG with by searching up our uh, publisher name, Asher Creativity. All right. Well, I'll put some links in the description, and uh, I gotta, I gotta get back to work. Do you have any parting words? Uh yeah. Be sure to follow me on, follow me on Kickstarter in particular, because we're doing a magazine soon that's designed to bring more people into the RPG fold and expose more people to different RPG mechanics, and you know, provide GM advice, mechanical instruction, narrative advice, and stuff like that, uh, all packed into one singular magazine that we're hoping to do monthly but we're starting off with the kickstarter so if you follow us at asher creativity on kickstarter you'll be able to uh know when that goes live hell yeah 
All right. Well, thanks everybody for joining us. And uh, we'll probably talk about this again sometime. We're just kind of on, under a bit of a time crunch. And we've got some other stuff we want to discuss uh, so that we can actually start throwing things at each other for our yeah. uh, vastly uh, different <laughs> beliefs. Uh, Saxius wants to say nerds. 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 Sid. And uh, Pete Giant says, have a look at Outdoor Survival and Source of the Nile by Avalon Hill. I mean, that's some old school shit. <laughs> it is some old schools. I sort of took a look at them for, uh, I, I, I went after the bras. Our guys were very instrumental in giving more, me more info on like hex sizes and what's usually one day. Uh, how do you integrate this with like armies moving about the map and stuff like that? They gave me a lot of resources to research. And a lot of these things were already on my research pile for Lords of Brackets. Mm. All right. Well, that's it. Peace out, everybody. Thanks for coming.